to all our mateys, chums and pals out there. Oh, look here, I've been punked already. Yes, I'm my wife's bitch. There we go. <laughs> welcome, welcome to Toya and Robert, ready, willing and utterly unable to do anything other than give you a shovel full of pile of useless and unqualified answers to only a few of your very many on fire burning questions. Hello everybody. Scott Smith, your question is fabulous. What is your favorite venue anywhere in the world to play? Go on. Well, you know me, I can't give one answer to anything. Wembley Arena, I've only played it twice and I loved every second of those twice times I've played it. But I have to add, the open air theatres I've performed in. At Regent's Park Theatre, open air, absolutely breathtaking. Holt Open Air Theatre, loved that. And I directed a play on Skyros, Skyros, Skyros. in Greece, yeah. in an open air amphitheatre overlooking the sea. It was breathtaking. What's yours? Well, I would say, all right, what are our criteria for judging this, this ace venue? And three things to take into account, the music, the musicians, and the audience. So, if you're rocking out, in other words, if it's a secular event, then I tend to like open air. But it depends on the quality, the, the kind of the music. For example, with King Crimson in expansive epic mode, then you have... Um, the Roman Forum in Verona we played, Red Rocks outside Denver, oh, astonishing. It, it, I mean, astonishing. But if you're getting down and dirty, what rock clubs do you like? Personally, I love Park West in Chicago. Not quite a rock club, but not quite theatre, but something in between. The Egg in Albany, I love. But most of all, uh, I adore playing in sacred spaces, churches, cathedrals. The humans have rocked out in churches in Wyapiddle. Uh, Wyapiddle was gorgeous. Yes. Uh, and that is in the Midlands. Um, it's part of Worcestershire, if, for those in America. We've also played Bishop's Cleave Church, which was breathtaking. You've played Coventry Cathedral and St Paul's Cathedral, both breathtaking. Pershaw Cathedral, breathtaking. Now, I've got to ask you this. Your reply to your favourite venues was detailed and almost scientific. Do you never walk into a building and just connect with the building and think this is great? Yes, I do. And the question then is why? Mm -hmm. And some, I was going on to this, but... I don't believe you, but you can go <laughs> on to it now. Some places have a spirit of place and energy there waiting for you. And sacred spaces the churches of estonia oh, oh god yeah oh my god oh Tallinn, tartu yes oh. but if you go into a site where there has been worship for 300 500 thousand years or pompeii there's a resonance of 2000 years of and it's waiting there for you to plug in and for the audience too. Now, some places like the Royal Albert Hall, which I've played it several times, times. Uh, it's considered an event and is hugely popular with audiences. As a musical event, I have some qualifications that historically the sound there has been appalling, but recently an awful, awful lot of money, a huge investment has gone into improving the sound and the sound is now excellent, there is something about playing at the Albert Hall which is special. Well, I wouldn't know. I've never played there. And if anyone's listening from the Albert Hall, I'd have no problems with sound whatsoever and I'll be very happy to play there. Now, there's two venues I've played that I want to tell you about, about sacred spaces. One is where I went to drama school in Birmingham. The old rep Birmingham Theatre School was in the old Birmingham Repertory Theatre. Lord Olivier worked there, John Gielgud worked there, all the classic British artists, actors worked there. And that space was sacred. They still held the space. 
their life experience was still in the space. Then when I was 18, I joined the National Theatre, which Laurence Olivier built um, and he was responsible for on the South Bank in London. And I was in the first production to open at the National Theatre, Tales from the Vienna Woods, one of the first productions. And I was the youngest member of the company and it was still a space that was being discovered by the actor's field of energy. And any performer, musical, actor, poet, writer has a field of energy. And what was really interesting about walking on the Olivier stage for the first time with the entire company, the Elizabeth Spriggs, Kate Nelligan, Warren Clark, I mean, everyone was in this production. And we were all finding our field of energy within this brand new space and it kept breaking down. And we were working on the first ever revolving stage of the time. Mm. And it was a, a manual revolve and it just kept jamming. And it was really interesting. And about halfway through the run of uh, Tales from the Vienna Woods, everything started to behave. And it was as if our fields of energy had put life into these massive concrete walls because it's a modern structure. And you find if you go into really well established art studios or, or art exhibition places like the Tate, the National Portrait Gallery, the Victoria and Albert Museum, they resonate. And this space wasn't resonating in 76, 77, but it started to resonate. And I went back at about 1988, 89 to do a play called Whale. And it, by then, wow, the building was rocking. So when you ask where are your favorite places to play and you give a very scientific list of qualities, I always walk into a building and I feel it's history. You're going to sit there quietly now. Well, I tell you a place I, I would like never to play again. Oh, God. Lagland Street Boys Club in Poole. Oh, what a terrible saying. It used to be said you could play the show, go out, walk around the block, have a meal, go down to the pub and come back and listen to the show you've just been playing. OK, for all you new musicians out there who are about to play every social club in the world, just be grateful you've got a gig. Don't be like him, OK? <laughs> Spoiled little princess tippy toes. Oh. <laughs> listen, hey, listen, babe, I'm a road warrior. I've been kicked around the roads of four continents. Ed Matthews, if Chad Smith showed up instead of Will Farrell, would you know the difference? Do you want to explain Chad Smith? Uh, Chad Smith, superb drummer with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, who did a famous double drum skit with Will Farrell. I it might have been on Jimmy Fallon. Um, sad thing, like whatever. It's, it's brilliant. It's it, absolutely brilliant. It really is a hoot. And would would I be able to tell the difference between them if it really came down to it? Yeah, I think Chad's drumming would have the edge and Will would be a little funnier. And Will would be at least a foot taller, surely. Yeah, he'd be on the way there, yeah. I, I, I would tell the difference. I'm a huge Will Farrell fan. Um, also, Chad Smith fan, but I mean, really, they're chalk and cheese, but both utterly brilliant. So thank you for that question. Star Trek, how do you all feel about Kanye West? So oh, this is a complex one. I, my feeling, standing in the sidelines with the history of Fripp and Kanye West, power, sampling 21st century schizoid man, I think Kanye behaved honourably. Yeah. And you'll tell the story in a minute. And I think it's a phenomenal accolade that someone who has a megalomaniac ability to gather things and put them together for him to choose a sample from you and then other samples that were really quite out there that's a clever mind and i think it's a phenomenal accolade um i am very very happy that uh, three seconds of schizoid man is sampled by Kanye on power I can go on with this for a very, very long time. Essentially, Kanye was screwed over by his record company, who kind of had it released before all the permissions had been 
He was one hour from performing it for the first time on the MTV Awards when he was told he didn't own the sample. And he phoned this house and he was honourable about it. Uh, it was... Um, for, all that, for all that two are, he was rehearsing. He was rehearsing to do Power Live with the sample. And for all that, Kanye has advisors, management team, all the rest. And Robert has management. And Robert's also an absolute monster. I am an absolute monster. <laughs> you can rely on this. My wife has told you. It came down to me actually calling Kanye, who was pulled out of rehearsals for the show the following day live. And it fell to me to actually authorise it because everything else from the business people was an utter screw up. So I spoke to Kenyi, artist to artist. He said very little. I did 98% of the talking, which my wife <laughs> would not be surprised. <laughs> and Kenyi did a lot of, uh-huh. Uh -huh. and, and I said to Kenyi, I'll make it happen, which uh -huh. I did. Now, if you come up to date, Universal Music, who were responsible for the really licensing and paying us the licensing royalties, currently underpaid in the region of at least $1 million. They have failed to honour the agreement of our, our agreement with them on all manner of levels. And at the moment, they are blocking us. Is this allegedly? No. Okay. No. At the moment, carry on. At the moment, they are, it has been estimated and suggested to me that they are allegedly spending in the region of £100,000 a year in legal fees, blocking us from going on to the perhaps allegedly underpayment of at least $1 million. But what I can say is that under our agreement, they were to provide us with a Kanye's contract upon which we would then calculate our royalties, they have not done so. This is 12 years later. In other words, they were a breach of contract. I, this is not uncommon, because I heard at one point the Spice Girls were owed 23 million by a company that should have known better and paid them that 23 million, allegedly. So, you know, this isn't uncommon in this industry. Go on. No, there may be. There may be some nice people from Universal looking into this. And I have been asked if I will authorise a High Court action against Universal in pursuit of our royalties. And I have said, yes, I am prepared to authorise this. So look, own up Universal, pay the money that's underpaid, honour the obligations which you undertook, show us the contract, let's take care of business and get on with everything. And Universal, I am not poor and I now own both the properties we live in, so my husband has nothing to lose. So, Archangel, you ask, I love your accent, guys. Is it London or what? Well, it's certainly not London. Can you do a good London accent, sweetie? Oh, <laughs> down the apple and pears? I don't know. No, dear, is the quick answer. <laughs> All right, how about Birmingham? My lovey is from Birmingham. I'm from Birmingham, and Birmingham talks like that, and it's quite a kind of down and dour, but very friendly kind of thing. Apparently, when I swear, I sound as though I'm from Birmingham. Shouldn't it be Birmingham? I have no idea. When I am studying for a role, I have a voice coach if I need an accent. And that's the only way I learn accents. How about you? Uh, I have a Dorset accent, albeit it's fairly mild. Uh, John Wetton, my late, late good friend, brother John, uh, whose birthday was last Saturday. When we were in touch with each other, both in email and when we spoke, it would be, What's on, mushy? And John would rather not quite take the mick, but John would do impersonations of me in my daughter, as may say does Jacko in the current crim. And me. Yes, it's true. Now, my accent is not extreme. Now, here's an analogy. William Barnes, uh, you know William Barnes? No. Oh, William, <laughs> Dor Dorset poet would write very, in the actual Dorset accent, Thomas Hardy had greater ambitions, so his Dorset accents were a little toned down a bit. 
But uh, regional dialects are, are kind of losing out a bit. The Dorset dialect in Witchhampton was different to that of Gussage up the road. Uh, Manswood, Mr. Smith of Manswood, who I knew when I was about 18, five miles from Wimborne, I, ring up, Dunham! I beg your pardon, Mr. Smith, ring up, Dunham! Translated to something like Aston Villa lost 5 2 on Saturday. Oh, thank you. Now, Mr. Elford, I once went into the garden and he said to me, Bees are gone like Dinkum, they was, let's dig it up with pollen. I said, I beg your pardon, Mr. Elford. Bees are gone like Dinkum, they was, the legs all dig it up with pollen. The bees were going like Dinkum, the legs all dig it up with pollen. And this is pure funny. nectar, it's gold. That is gold. Mr. Elford was the beekeeper and I kept hives. And that's been in every house we've lived in for 35 years. I still have a few left. Now, Great Britain is renowned for the amount of dialects it ha has. There are hundreds and hundreds of dialects. But you wanted me to tell the story of how I was taught to speak. Yes. Okay, so when I was born, I was born with a really high roof of the mouth. So I had to be taught how to speak. I didn't pick language up. So I had a vocal coach from the age, I think of about six till I was 11, who taught me where to place my tongue so that I could form syllables, which might be why I don't have a Birmingham accent because everything is about placing the tongue on the back of my upper front teeth. And then when the National Theatre signed me, they continued my speech training to lessen my speech impediment, um, which was very kindly called a list, but it was a little bit more than that. It, it was kind of, I could not form words at all. So I had to learn how to use my tongue a little bit more than most people use their tongues. So now I know why my wife doesn't have the Brummage and Glottal stop. That's, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely it. So Robert, Sweetly. Suede Dogs asks, you say you avoid prog, but King Crimson are a progressive rock band. Progressive is an attitude, prog is a label. And who says King Crimson is a progressive rock act? It's a, it's a contemporary music ensemble. Okay, we're going to go out today on a question that came in on Facebook by someone who was very concerned that we don't wear wedding rings. So why don't you wear your wedding ring? Ah, uh, because I hold you in my heart. <laughs> I'm sorry, that really, I know what you mean, but to a woman out there who wants a man to wear a wedding ring, I mean, we've all been bluffed by that one. So why don't you wear your wedding ring? It constrains my fingers. Okay. So what I do, I have my wedding ring here on my unicorn horn, which I keep by my bedside table along with this dowsing pendulum. I don't wear my wedding ring um, because as an actress, I never want to be caught in a scene with it still on and those kind of things can happen in movies. And also, I do, the only time I really wear it is when I'm traveling alone, just because it's like a lovely barrier. I, I, I travel alone a lot and I'm very, very small and people take advantage of that. And my wedding ring is my protection. So I do wear it when I'm traveling the world alone. You know, sometimes I go to Australia on my own. I go to America on my own. I go to Japan on my own. And I find the wedding ring just gives me the respect and the protection that I need. But otherwise, I don't feel I need to wear it. That's an, that's an excellent answer. Well, there you are, you have my answer. So everyone, thank you very much for your questions. Um, we're going to have some burning guitars. Welcome to Toya and Robert's Burning Guitars. <laughs>
true, I'm punked out. My bitch. <laughs>